Welcome to Business Unveiled Podcast. This is the place where we help overwhelmed, time-starved entrepreneurs like you make the profitable shifts to get more done and get more out of life. I'm your host, Angela Prophet, award-winning eight-figure entrepreneur and CEO. And in every episode of Business Unveiled, I'm bringing you conversations that will give you the expertise and strategies that will scale your team and business so you can get shit done. That's GSD in our world. So get your time back and grow a business that helps you be present in your life. Let's do this, y'all. He has probably taken some pictures that you might have purchased off of the internet, which I just learned, which is so neat, but he made the leap, the jump that most of you listening or watching that you've probably made. I know I lived a double life for about 10 years and then made the leap to being full-time entrepreneur and owning a business, which is not easy, but the job that he has is something that I don't know, little kids just like look up to it and it's like, oh, I want to go to space one day. And so we're going to get to hear that today and and hear John's story. So I'm super excited. So John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Angela. I'm excited. Okay. So before we start talking about photography and the, the luxury portrait market, like tell us your journey to even starting your business. But of course, like how did you get to go to space? Like, oh my gosh, it's just so neat. Give us a little backstory. Yeah. So one of the deals that my, well, then fiance gave me, who's now my wife, whenever I took the job working for a NASA contractor was I was not allowed to go to space myself. She said, that's, that's, oh. that's a deal breaker. So fortunately I never had the opportunity to go to space. Um, but I did work on numerous projects that went to Mars and that's actually what I got hired to do. I was a test engineer to make sure that these, you know, million dollar projects that we were zipping across to our next planetary neighbor didn't crash and burn literally <laughs> into the surface oh of gosh, the planet. That's stressful. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And the job that got me into that was because I taught rock climbing for the Boy Scouts. I wasn't a Boy Scout. I didn't know how to rock climb before that summer. Uh, but I was planning to work for Disney uh, as an in, in an internship at the Disney Imagineers when I was, I think, a junior in college at Penn State in mechanical engineering and had all the plans to work there. And it was down to me and one other person. I was so confident I had no plan B, which you'll see as a theme in my life, um, <laughs> not having a plan B. Um, and long story short, didn't get the internship. And I was so dejected and just sitting down on my couch whenever I got the, the phone call, because this is back in the nineties. So like the phone was attached to the wall in my, <laughs> in my room. So that's, yeah, there was no, like, you know, in some cool coffee shop getting the bad news. It was, I was just sitting in my room and uh, the guy lived in the room next to me in our fraternity house walked by and Bill said, Hey, you're all right, Melora. I said, no, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do this summer. So he worked for the Boy Scouts out in New York City and said, you know, you want to come work up there, you can work in the maintenance crew, and then we'll teach you how to, you know, be a director of something or other. You're out towards the, I said, yeah, sure. So I spent the first probably six to eight weeks working for the maintenance crew, and I was the unskilled labor. So I'd carried everyone's tools, <laughs> and I got saddled with the very unglamorous jobs, like pulling the mice that had fallen in the toilets in the cabins during the course of the winter my job was pulling them out like, oh my god <laughs> it was awful <laughs> it was, terrible i can't think of a greater stay in school message than pulling dead mice out of toilets you know for your job so when the opportunity came to teach rock climbing for them even though i had no idea how to do that i said yeah sure sign me up anything but that and i think actually at the time when they asked me i was like scrubbing rust off of like a propane tank out in the sun and i'm like yeah, and it, yeah, get me away from the dead mice and the, you know, canisters of explosive gas with me with a metal brush scraping them. I'll do anything. Oh, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they sent me to class. It was super intensive. It was like a week. They were like 14 hour days. And I learned everything I needed to to hopefully not kill any young scouts <laughs> you know, spending their vaca <laughs> summer vacation with us in the Catskills. 
Um, so we, I successfully ran a crew all summer. We had like, I think seven to 800 kids from inner city, New York scouts come up that we, you know, had them rappelling and rock climbing and just having the time of their lives. So I put that on my resume whenever it came time for me to graduate a few years later. And I was doing a phone interview with the company that, um, did the spacesuit and other thing for NASA. And they said, what is this about rock climbing? Why is this on here? And the director of engineering was a student up and said, Hey, hang on, there's someone I want you to talk to. Cause I was interviewing for like a project manager job, uh -huh. which knowing what project managers do now, I would be horrible at it. Like, <laughs> awful. <laughs> like schedules, budget, like detail. stay on track. Yeah. Not my thing, man. Um, so he said, hang on, I got something you, I want you to talk to. And like, it was on mute. And again, like, this is the nineties. So like, I'm on like my cordless phone now, you know, the big like metal antenna. Yeah. Cause that's how I rolled. And this nasally voice gets on the phone after I was on hold for like, what seemed like an eternity. And this nasally voice goes, Hey, what do you think about rock climbing on Mars? And me being the, you know, proverbial smart ass that I am I go well, are you gonna pay my airfare because if not that's a deal breaker and like I said that and went oh crap I just that's actually it. hilarious but like in that moment like I got that like cold sweat like when you pass a state trooper going like way too fast and you get that yeah that's how I felt I'm like I just I just blew this oh my gosh and this, this mystery voice on the air and said get him down here and I was like okay so I came down, it was like a six hour drive from Penn State. It's the, the company's in Delaware. And this guy's name was Skip. And he was like the lead test engineer for the systems that landed robots on Mars, like from the nineties on. And wow. when they saw in my resume that I had decent enough grades in engineering, but that I had like practical skills and they could send out in the field and not get themselves killed. That's what perked this guy Skip's interest because he was a former special forces veteran did test operations for the air force for like 20 years and now he's leading these nasa missions and he's like i don't need some egghead that can do calculations i need some pseudo egghead that i can send down to the real world so that's how i ended up testing things that like i said eventually landed on mars we did the spirit and opportunity mars rovers for nasa the beagle lander for um the british space program and I did that for 15 years, worked on anything with high-tech fabrics. So I've worked on everything from advanced fighter jets to, they sent me to Antarctica once. And I'm not sure if they sent me there to get rid of me. But I eventually <laughs> made my way back. <laughs> but yeah, I found myself in just these wild situations all because like I had this job where I was tired of pulling dead mice from toilets. That's pretty much what set the course for the rest of my professional engineering career. Which just, that's I sound, great. Yeah, it's a great like, story. I sound like Walter Mitty, like when I tell these stories. I'm like everyone's <laughs> just gonna think I'm full of crap. <laughs> but, but it's, it's all truth. it's all relationships, yeah, you know. It's absolutely. like you're the guy in the frat house, you know, walking by, and what if he hadn't walked by? Yeah. You know, it's like timing is everything, and yeah. so it's like everything happens for a reason. So then, okay. So then you're doing that for like 15 years. And then where does the love for photography even come in? Yeah. So the love for, for photography, like started when I was, I think on my seventh or eighth birthday, because, and stick with me here, Angela. Yeah. I wanted a hamster. Okay. That's, that's what I wanted. And my mom and her infinite wisdom thought John doesn't have the follow through to take care of a hamster. Like no way. So on a lark, she bought me a camera and this is like, 1984 so it was like an old school little kodak film camera had like the flash bulbs that would expire and i just i fell in love with it and to this day my mom's like i have no idea why i got that for you other than you like being creative and i thought this will be techie enough that he's not going to bother me about some damn hamster <laughs> <laughs> so so it, photography had always been my just a hobby I just loved creating mm -hmm. I just I could always just see things people would always be like how did you see that when to take that picture I'm like how couldn't you so it's just something that's always come naturally for me um and traveling extensively for my engineering job um I always had my camera with me so I looked at it as like you know in my little like dream world I'd I was going to do these cool engineering things but I was always be like man this must be what's like working for like National Geographic I'm going to Antarctica or I'm 
they're sending me to Hawaii or I'm on my way to China. So I'd like put myself in these little like photo assignments, like when I had off time. I love work. it. <laughs> and it eventually became like this like safe haven for me because the company I worked for was bought by venture capitalists and it really changed how the the whole philosophy and vibe of the company um, from like a small family run company to like, hey, let's see if we can do this next technological thing to, you know, how much, how much profit are we going to make on this? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't mean bad connotation with the word profit, but. <laughs> you know. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, but it, and I, I was watching these like major layoffs happening around me, like multiple rounds. And it was like the, you know, anyone who's worked a corporate job, it's like, oh, there's no way they'll, they'll let, you know, Bob go holy crap did you hear they just let bob go it's like oh shit like yeah so i started doing photography more seriously probably in like 2014 2015 like joined the local art league and sold like my first like art piece as a little five by seven like black and white and i thought i you know it was so cool i got paid like 30 dollars for Aww. it um but that's when i really started ramping up my photography is because i really needed something to focus on that had a lot of positivity because I'd gone through a tremendous amount of personal change in my life starting like in 2009. And then it really just coincided with my company changing focus and photography really just came something that, that kept me afloat, you know, you know, spiritually. Yeah. Do, do you like to shoot? Um, like, I mean, when I think of national geographic, I think of like, south africa and like animals and nature and yeah. was there something that you were like just naturally drawn to or was it just anything i was always drawn to the stories that like national geographic told i can remember the first time i saw a national geographic magazine i think it was from 1987 or 88 it was a it was an issue on like pompeii and I can remember looking at it on my grandparents' coffee table, and like the, you know, old steel town I grew up in, in Western Pennsylvania. And like just seeing these like fantastical stories of like places I'd never seen. Like I'd been to like where I grew up and like we'd go to Cape May, New Jersey for vacation every year, but like I really had not gone anywhere else. And I can just remember looking, you know, inside the National Geographic and be like, wow, there's like a whole world out there. So I started out just taking pictures of landscapes, you know, sunsets, clouds, all that kind of stuff. And I always said, absolutely no way would I ever want to take pictures of people. And, you know, anyone who's a student enough caught that I do luxury portraits now. Um, so <laughs> that all really ties into the amount of like personal growth and change that I had because you know, even though I had I have like a literal wall, if I wanted to hang everything up of like commendations from like Department of Defense and all these other NASA and alphabet soup agencies, I never believed any of it. I had huge case of imposter syndrome, you know, despite all these like tangible accolades. Um, so the desire to not want to ever photograph people back in the day was just a manifestation of that because I didn't want to appear like foolish or like I didn't know what I was doing. So once I got past that through a lot of personal development and soul searching, and this took years, by the way, this isn't like a switch flipped. Um, I really was drawn to being able to help people tell their stories and, and showcasing like the amazing things that are inside of people that they don't believe because I know how that feels, mm -hmm. not believing what other people tell you. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty low place to be. So mm -hmm. I take great pride in having, being able to use the gift that I had, cause I have no formal photography training. I have no bachelor of fine arts or anything like that. Um, I'm just able to connect with people very well. Which is not easy for everybody. So, but how did you, like, did something happen at your job or did you, like plan this I, th I feel like I know the answer but <laughs> <You> <laughs> did something answer. happen where it's like today's the day that uh peace out corporate world and I'm starting my business like because there's a lot of people that like listen and watch 
the podcast that, I mean, I lived in healthcare and luxury wedding world for a good 10 years. And Mm -hmm. there was an opportunity, like something happened that presented itself to make me within 24 hours to have to make a freaking decision. Like, do I want to jump and do I want to try this thing? And I can always go back or, you know, I, I feel like the opportunity had to be that way. Cause I wasn't like a quitter and I didn't want to like quit anything, even though it was like asking on what I was doing, but like, did something happen or like you planned it out? Yeah. You, I'm sure you know that and there, there's no way I planned it out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my, that's not my thing. My, my wife is the peanut butter in the relationship and I'm very Aww. much the jelly. <laughs> that's just yeah. all over the place. Um, but no, it, it was more of a slow fade over years, years um, that I just wasn't content with what I was doing. I didn't, it didn't inspire me anymore because I, I used to be so gung ho and really believe in what we were doing. And when the company really switched really to just like a profit focus and like we are almost berated for taking on these technological jobs. It, it really just killed my inspiration to work there. And so I went and found another engineering job, you know, because what, what self-respecting father of three and husband, you know, quits their job working in like rural Southern Delaware to go be a professional photographer and leave like six figures behind. Yeah. So I went and worked at this other job. It was still in the aerospace field. Um, you know, i worked with great people again and you know they would fly me to like meetings in china and like first class and like i mean it was like on paper is fantastic mm-hmm. and my soul had never been more dead i remember it was a day it sounds like you're having in nashville right now like just rain and like awful weather and we're in coastal delaware so like it's always 100 percent humidity even in the winter and like 35 degrees and rain like that's pretty miserable I can just remember walking into work one day and the rain's like going down the back of my jacket. And I thought, thank God I'm getting paid so much money to be this miserable. Yeah. And like that hit me like a two by four to the eyes. I'm like, like what kind of example am I setting for my kids? Right. Like if my friend came to me and said, you know, I'm, I, I don't feel satisfied. I don't feel fulfilled. You know, what should I do? I'd be like, well, let's come up with a plan, dude, and like do something different. I'm like, I'm modeling for my kids. That's okay to like hate every moment of your waking life at work, which was like nine to 10 hour days, of course, Mm -hmm. just for like a huge paycheck. So I said to my wife, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm miserable. She's like, well, no shit, John. I can't, <laughs> anyone with a pair of eyes can see that you have the power of like a wet ashtray. <laughs> um, so I was like, what? Well, you know, I, I, I got these photography skills I've been blessed with. I don't know how to sell it and went to a networking meeting. And f- it was finally like, oh my God, there's like people out there that like network and you know, you can get your, your business in front of people and refer each other. And oh my God, like blew my mind because whole nother world. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Like in, in the, you know, government engineering world, like that's not how it worked at all. (laughs) Um, No, it was like a 180 from that. So once I found out about like all these different opportunities and they're like, oh my God, people actually meet and have coffee at meetings and aren't in some test site in the middle of the Mojave desert. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah. People do that. Um, And she's like, you got to take this chance. She's like, if this doesn't work out, like if the photography thing flops, like you you can get another job. She's like, you already left one job. Cause I, I looking back on it, like you said, everything happens for a reason. I left the job that I had been at for 15 years to go to this other job, which by the way, I lasted nine months before I, you know, wrote my resignation letter. <laughs> Dear Mr. Dolan, I, John Malora, senior systems engineer, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> resign. I didn't even make it a year at this place. Um, and so, yeah, on April, April 7th, I think of 2017 is my last day working in the corporate world. How'd that feel though? Like, are you like finally? To, I want. I'm going to do something different. 
Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a ton of fear because I, sure. you know, I left, I had zero clients lined up. I think the first, uh, client I got paid me like, I don't know, $425. And I immediately took $350 of that and went and invested in the uh, Jeremy Cowart's like photography program. He's a mm-hmm. Nashville guy. Yeah. Um, I know Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and his brother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I worked and, with uh, his brother uh, okay. years ago. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, invest in Jeremy's thing. I'm always like, you spent how much money of what you just earned? But his course and just the way Jeremy um, approaches photography was such that humanitarian heart is how I've really structured my business and have created projects and, you know, gotten to know Jeremy, you know, over the years and, you know, we photographed each other and he's helped me develop various projects through some of his things. So it, you know, it, it, it's all meant to be. What would you say to someone that is thinking about like making the leap? Would you say plan it out a little bit better? Or would you say, don't wait so long, like just fucking jump and do it. <laughs> um, it, I think a hybrid of those, mm-hmm. one of the things that, that really saved us was we had, we had, we were savers, you know, just financially. So we had a pretty nice padding to absorb that initial shock for sure. Um, because that, that allowed us to, and allowed me to be a little bit more selective and not just jump on anything Mm -hmm. um, that came along. So that's a huge thing. Um, try to, if you can, you know, try to have some kind of financial cushion Mm -hmm. to do it. And then really, it, it's that fine line you have to walk when you're an entrepreneur of do I, how, how far down do I want to niche down? And people always say niche down, niche down, niche down. Well, you might not know what you want to do yet. Mm-hmm. It's so hard. Have a, having an idea of what you want to do, um, you know, understand might take some time to develop, but the biggest thing I can recommend to people is I don't know if you're affiliated with a coaching program or not, but like coaching, coaching mm-hmm. mentors, they are worth their weight in absolute gold. Yep. Like these people have gone through the ringer and like gotten the bruises and lumps and bumps and contusions. Like that $500 is going to be so worth it. Mm-hmm. So worth it. Yeah. Mastermind groups, all that kind of stuff is so instrumental in making these kind of giant leaps. Yeah. They always say like, find someone who's doing what you want to do and then follow them. But to your point about what you just said, a lot of people don't really know. And like, for me, I was, I think like floundering as an entrepreneur for about a year. And then a friend of mine who was a lighting designer that I worked with a lot. He's like, there's this thing called entrepreneur organization and they have a thing called catalyst. And he's like, you're going to die of a stroke. You work too much. Like, this is just crazy. And they teach you how to do it differently. I'm like, I don't have time for that. And it was an 18 month commitment and like, I don't know, five grand or something at the time. And it, it wasn't even about the money. It was about the time mm-hmm. we, we had money in the bank. It was just, I wasn't busy doing the right things. Yeah. And I was so young in owning a business. I didn't even own a business. I had a job because I was allowing my clients to dictate my schedule, which really is a job. And I mean, I always say like that group and my forum, my business group that I'm still in today, 12 something years later, it, I mean, it probably saved my life because yeah. I, I just didn't, my parents were entrepreneurs. I mean, I grew up, my family had entrepreneurship but they lived on the Gulf coast. And so I wasn't around it all the time. And you just don't know what you don't know. And so I, I agree wholeheartedly. It's like every year I get a new mentor and I stay in that business group and we all help each other. None of us are in the same industry. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. We all have the same challenges because we, we own a business. And so, so fast forward to now and you've been, I will say like now your dream job, but it's like leaving what most people would think is a dream job to, you know, what you're doing now. What, what are 
your favorite things to do? Like, what are you doing now? And like, what's coming up next for your business? Yeah, the I, I love telling people's stories. <clears throat> so, you know, be, doing their portraits and also finding their, their, the stories like behind them. Like I just did a, a project, the one Jeremy um, helped me develop um, called the Refigured Project where we took photos of people's, it started out with like photos of their physical scars. And about a year ago, um, my friend Ashley contacted me, her husband had major surgery to remove like a couple hundred tumor, cancerous tumors out of his body. So like they split them from like stem to stern. And she said, you know, Monty's like scared to go to the beach and like scare children. And she said, is there any way that you could create portraits of people with scars to help them flip the script on that victim mentality and show them as celebrations of survival? Mm -hmm. And so, so we did, we, we launched the project and I forget how many people we've, we've had come through in about a year, but it's, it's close to like 20 or 30 where we create these portraits and other photographers were picking up, but across the country, like someone did a shootout in like, I think Bakersfield, California, like the other end of the country, just to tell these people's stories. So it, it's been amazing watching the power that photography has, because when you see a picture, especially when it gets printed out, it's like, wow, like, this is how people see me. Like I've had people say that they're like, you made me look so beautiful. I'm like, I pushed the button on the camera. I'm like, this is, this is you. This is how I saw you walk into my studio and this is how people see you. So now you have proof of how you look and how other people really see you. So that's one of my favorite things about doing portraits. That's so neat though. Like I remember um, through EO, we had a speaker come. He, his brand is called the Daymaker. He owns Aveda and a bunch of salons and, he was living in Hawaii and had um, a lot of pain in his hip. He was a surfer and went to the doctor and they're like, you have bone cancer. You're going to die real soon. And so, you know, he told his staff and, and everyone that worked there, you know, knew somebody who had had some type of cancer and they pulled together just people in their Rolodex of like, what doctors could he get a second, third, fourth opinion? And, um, you know, he ended up documenting this, what most would see is like horrible, horrible journey of going through this cancer and losing just all of his hair. And I mean, he's like, I own hair salons. You know? like, right. It was just so weird. And he like, um, you know, has all, he speaks all over the world now, you know, sharing his story, like don't give up. But that's one of the photography projects that, it, that just really sticks out because that photographer, it was, it was so emotional and, but it was like a beautiful thing because his kids and his family like got to see like, this is where you started. This is what they went through with treatment here. were here's what we were told. Here's some options. If you're not okay with that option, keep looking and searching for more answers because mm -hmm. it isn't always the ultimate answer. And he documented all that through photography and it was really, really powerful. Like, you know, I'll never forget that. And but, but he's like, it was hard being a leader in, in the beauty world and then completely stripping, you know, everything off and um, being very vulnerable. And he's helped a lot of people, you know, because of it. So there are some like beautiful things. And I love that because when you see, especially children, you know, when they outwardly, when, if they've never been exposed to like scars or if someone looks different than the norm of what they see, like at home or in school or at church or the gym or wherever your kids are, it's like, how do you teach them to uh, be more understanding and how to approach uncomfortable, which may be uncomfortable for them. But, you know, if you have photography and you can explain it to them or a movie or something like that, it, it really helps. So I can tell now, like through what you're doing already. And I mean, I don't know you that well, but it's like you enjoy telling those stories that brings you passion and that fills your soul, which is way better than what you were doing. So it's like, just follow the purpose. Would you say that that's a, I mean, that's a fair statement, I guess is like, if you know that there's something more like move and keep going, just like don't stay miserable for the money. Yeah, absolutely. Don't stay miserable for the money. And 
it doesn't always have to be an all in right off the bat. And you could, like, I took a lot of steps, you know, like you said, was there something that happened where I eventually I was like, screw it. And, you know, resigned on the spot. It, it wasn't, it wasn't that, but I'd been like building up this like side hustle for, for years and found it really brought me joy and also brought other people joy. So that that's the common thread. And that's always a big piece of advice I give to people is, you might not know the specifics about something, but try to figure out that common thread that runs through everything that you really like. And that, that can help you navigate, you know, your passion slash career and relationships. There'll be some kind of common thread. Like I, I love being the first to do something. I love, I love coming up with, with that idea and I probably need help launching it because I'm not so good with the production phase of it. Yeah. Um, but that's also really important to know that I'm not good at that. I'm, I'm not good at scheduling things and coming up with a post today. Like that, not, not my thing. Like I, I need help with that. And that's really important to understand your strengths and your weaknesses, what they call that um, SWOT. Yep. SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are super helpful, you know, self assessments to go through. Well, and as you were like making all these changes, you know, there's all these personal changes that, that lead you to quitting your job. Would you say that one of the biggest, it sounds to me like one of the biggest cheerleaders is your wife and she was like, do it. And so even going back to happiness, because we've planned and done thousands of weddings around the world, it's like, you know, I tell couples so often like if the happiness of your partner isn't there like you can't complete each other and I I don't even like it when people say like oh they complete I mean it's like a freaking Jerry Maguire movie but I'm like no you need to like be whole yourself first before you like bring somebody else into like the mix and then get married and like start a life together but would you say that like the people around you like your support system is just as important because what if she wasn't that supportive and then you were stuck in that job? Like, was that really important to you? Like, what were some things that happened that were like all the signs were leading to you quitting or resigning? Like, would you say that your wife really was the one that like shoved you in the butt and was like, oh, you need to do this? Like, the people yeah. are important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My wife packs a punch when she kicks me in the ass. She's a black belt, so oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's a, she's a force. Um, but that that's absolutely the pivotal moment of when. So I, I guess to answer your question. The pivotal pivotal moment was not necessarily something that happened at work. It's when my wife said, "Go for it," which was so out of character for her. As I mentioned, she's the peanut butter in this in this relationship. Not not her thing to usually like to say, we'll just go for it. You know, you want to talk about someone who has a plan. It's like, she, she's got, she's the, she likes to have a destination. I'm, I'm comfortable just having a direction. So to her have hear her say like, go for it. I'm like, Oh shit. Now I have no excuse. Mm-hmm. Cause you have the support. Yeah. So how, ha like over the past five years, like for your family, you have three kids, like what has changed? over um, the, the past five years it whenever whenever like business would get slow and like i would you know get bummed out mm -hmm. my wife would be like dude look at everything else like you're able to like make the kids breakfast every morning like drive them to school kind of and then you know, be there right when they get off the bus and like get the happenings for the day before they're like, you know, what happened, what went down at school before they're like too tired to like talk or just don't even want to care and don't care anymore. She's like, you get to hear all that. She's like, before when we both worked full time, because she, my wife's a, a high school teacher. Um, God bless her. Um, yeah, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> she, you know, like we would like scramble to get the kids out the door at like, out the door at like 6 50 a.m and we're talking like a one-year-old a three-year-old and a five-year-old oh my gosh drop them off at daycare you know get to work work our nine to ten hour days like 
try not to be the last parents to pick them up at 5 30 in the dark in the winter mm-hmm. come home feed them dinner give them a bath read a story go to bed and then you know do it all over all over day. again <laughs> and she's like dude like you get to like hang out with them she's like i come home most days you're like throwing a football with our son now great i might have a photo shoot later that night or something to do uh, but she's like look at all that time you get and thank god i had i had the flexibility i did during covid because being a teacher like my wife was like in zoom hell like trying yeah. to figure all that out in like march and april of 2020 Mm-hmm. like trying to get her feet under her and, and doing all of that. So like I, I was able to go through the, the, cause I wasn't really working. No one was really doing commercial shoots, which is what I used to do in like April, 2020. Yeah. Um, that, that was, that was kind of stopped. Um, so like I was able to like be my kid's school teacher and science lessons were like tons of fun with dad, like out there, like here's how you mix this and this together and it'll go boom if you put it in a two liter soda bottle let's go try that <laughs> so, so. and pray it doesn't blow up everywhere <laughs> I, I used to handle explosives it's all good it, you know alka seltzers are nothing um <laughs> and, <laughs> and totally in my wheelhouse but yeah the past like like since covid like thank god i had the the flexibility i did and then like even like with their wonky school schedules like two days in person, two days off, Wednesdays are off, but you know, you had to be there to like answer questions. Like I could be there for all of that. Mm -hmm. Like like looking back on it, like even just saying this now, it's like, man, what a blessing. Mm -hmm. Like on those days where like, and there, there have been days in entrepreneurial world where I've literally been crying on the floor, like growing up in a little ball, not knowing what the fuck's going to happen next. Yep. Um, you know, it, it, it being captain of my own my own ship, so to speak, to be really cheesy is is awesome. And I'll just conclude with saying I would probably be a horrible employee now <laughs> working for someone else. I think, I we think both I'm pretty would. unemployable now. I'm yeah. Pretty straight up unemployable. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think but, that's a good thing. Yeah, it's definitely a good thing. Cause then I feel like if it were that easy, then the world of small business and creatives, like we really would not be thriving, Right? you know, if it was, if it was that easy. Um, But it sounds to me like a lot of what you worked through was personal development and working with coaches and mentors and having a positive outlook to everything. And instead of playing the victim, like, oh, I'm so you know, pissed. And, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I watched people around my parents that went to the same cubicle every day and hated their life. And they had a beautiful house and drove a nice car and it's just, it's not worth it. But until you get older, at least for me, I didn't really understand like what all that meant because for so long it was drilled into my head of like job security, job security, job security. And it's like, well, why not create your own security? And then, if you do have downtime or anything like that, look at it from a positive angle. Like your wife said, like you have all this time with your kids where you can never buy that time back. It's so precious and it's so valuable. So I just, I think like when I mentor people and they're like, when should I quit my job? When's the right time? I'm like, it's never the right time. No, you just have no, to freaking go never the right time. Never, yeah. never. It's never the right time. Like just, just do it. Do you have like one favorite project that, that you have shot in the last five years that just really stands out? I think the, that refigured project that I did last year, really, it, it was so eye opening for so many reasons because it, it, it illustrated the amount of weight that some people carry on their shoulders and their knees aren't buckling. It, it was amazing. Like some of these stories I would hear um, a girl that was like going, like going to be a model. And when she was, I think 15, someone thought that their boyfriend had a crush on her. So slashed her face 
with a straight razor walked up oh behind gosh. her on the street outside of Coney Island, New York, and just slashed the hell out of her face. I forget how many hundreds of stitches she had. Um, but she came in for a refigured shoot because she wanted to show people that beauty is, uh, she, she quoted her grandma, um, Girly Bell was her grandma. And that's actually what she ended up naming the makeup company she started to show people that beauty is only skin deep. And mm -hmm. she said she wanted to come in and partake in the refigured project because she wanted to have a record of that and really show people that. Wow. Um, so just hearing those stories was a, is amazing, but it also helped me because I thought, how could I ask people to share their, you know, these like very personal and intimate stories if I wasn't willing to. So I always wanted to be a soldier growing up. I always wanted to be in you know, a pilot, Navy SEAL type, type high speed dude. The only problem was I was born with club foot. Um, when I was born, they said, your son will be able to walk likely, but running and athletics are probably not in the cards for him. And here's my dad, who was a, you know, standout collegiate football player at the university of Pittsburgh, hearing uh -huh. this about his like firstborn and only son. Um, so my parents never let me be that a, a deterrent but and they they never told me I couldn't do anything so mm -hmm. I became a black belt myself ice hockey player but I always had this in the back of my head because that's what prevented me from doing my my quote dream job of being in the military like it just straight up wasn't allowed um, I was disqualified I always you know looked down on my right foot because it's like it's like disfigured and it's like two sizes smaller and I have this like giant scar running up the back of my calf and all the surgeries I had as a kid and I thought I can't ask people to be a subject in the refigured project if I'm not willing to share this very little known thing about me mm -hmm. so I photographed myself and I was actually I was the first subject okay and so this all makes much more sense yeah <laughs> This so, was way closer to home. <laughs> yeah. So, and that was never the intent. Whenever I started it, someone asked sure. me to do this. Um, and those photos I took of myself are what I think of, like if I lose my balance doing a beach body program or something, and I, mm -hmm. I, you know, get frustrated and be like, oh my God, this stupid bad right foot. But then I think back to the pictures I took of myself. It's like, yeah, you lost your balance look at your foot like it's shaped like the letter c backwards like um so it, that project not only how it's helped other people but about how that hits so close to home for me and has really helped reframe and that's actually where the name came from refigured because i looked at my foot when i saw it in the back of my camera i thought oh my god i'm like a disfigured freak is what i thought in my head mm -hmm. and i said you need to stop that shit Yep. Like you need to refigure. You're not just figured. You need to refigure how you say that, how you think about yourself. I love that. And that's where it came from. So helping other people. And then I in turn ended up helping myself. Who knew? That's amazing. That's yeah. such a great story though. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it. No I mean, it, it means so much more when you help yourself and, you know, something bad or, happens around me or my business or something. I mean, coming from mental health and working in a mental health hospital, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, shit could be so much worse, Angela. Like, don't be sorry. Don't play the victim and don't be sorry for yourself. Like it could be a lot worse, but then there's a lot of people around me, especially my family. They haven't been exposed to any of that and they probably never will. And so sometimes when they're having like a knockdown drag out, like, Oh my God, things are coming to an end. You know, just, I mean, even yesterday, my niece is texting me about a TikTok that she posted that my mother didn't like. And I'm like, oh my God, this is not a big problem. And I don't have time for this right now. Like it's, it's a trending sound, mother. Like get off the 19 year old's case. But, you know, for them and, and their community, that, you know, is a big deal. So I have to sometimes take a step back and remember, like not everyone has the same experiences as we do to, you know, put things into perspective and it helps me respond a little bit better than, 
uh, dismissing it, you know, like stop and address it, especially with the kids, you know, like trying to teach them. So yeah, that's really people interesting. Where they're at is so important. Yes, it Just is so important. People where they're at and, you know, loving on them and understanding. And, you know, I might not get everything in my eight-year-old son's Minecraft world that just blew up, but he's upset about it. So like, I didn't talk about the creepers and the whatever else just happened that I don't get, but just showing that empathy Mm -hmm. to people. And man, what a, what a world we'd live in if people really had more empathy for each other. It's one thing I struggle with. Like I did strength. Have you done strength finders? Uh, I've done like, yeah, like the Enneagrams and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. On strength finders, it's like, th- I think it's like 30 something and you like have the top five and then like the bottom five and they're like, focus on the top five because that's what you're good at. And all the, the 20 something like outsource that my very last trait is empathy. <laughs> like, oh, oh wow. that's not so good. You know, so it's something that I have to work on, but what set me up for that is working in a mental hospital and having that mentality of like, listen, shit is not bad right now. You think it's bad. It could be way worse not to compare or anything, but again, it just puts things in perspective. Oh, yeah. So if people want to, is this, so the project that you're talking about, is it public somewhere? Like, can people go online and like see it or is it a book or where can people check it out? Yeah, it is on Facebook and Instagram. It's refigured R E F I G U R E D project. Uh, they can put it in there and, and just read some of the stories that we've had. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm getting ready to do the the final two just because, you know, we, we've had some volunteer changeover because we had professional writers that would then volunteer their time to, to craft the stories as they meant to be crafted. So the project had a, had a pretty good run of almost a year. Um, but, you know, if anyone wanted to pick it back up, like I said, there have been photographers and writers that have done it all across the country. But, yeah, just check it out, Refigured Project on Facebook and Instagram. That's awesome. And if they want to connect with you, what is the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah. So I, I also am on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> They're John Malora um, photography and um, I have a website, Malora photo, which is being totally rebranded right now. <laughs> um, so that's exciting slash terrifying. Um, but yeah, they can, they can reach out to me through social media or my website. That's exciting. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story today. And thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Angela. I'm glad uh, Brand Builders brought us together. I am so glad. We'll talk about that in a second too. So we're in this group together, y'all. It's it's a phenomenal group. The founders, um, one of the founders was in my old EO forum, entrepreneur organization, before they had two kids kind of back to back. And I was actually at an event just a couple of days ago with them. So oh, it's, yeah. oh, um, cool. it's pulled a lot of just really, really talented people together to help bring clarity, I would say, to like the difference between a company, company brand and a personal brand. And so Roy and I, people in our EO forum, they're like, do you guys do the same thing? We're like, no, we don't do the same thing at all we understand like the digital marketing world. I'm like, but I work with companies and, you know, really in the hospitality space specifically. And then, you know, they work in the personal branding space. And what I've learned though, even through really successful entrepreneurs is that they don't know the difference because it's never been really presented to them. And so it's been a really, really great program just to get clarity around what needs to be in a personal brand. That needs to be a whole nother podcast. I talked to Rory about that the other day. Yeah, right. <laughs> like that's its own thing. But anyway, we'll get to that next. Um, but we'll put all of your links in the show notes and, and share it out with everybody. And just thank you so, so much for sharing. This was awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the platform, Angela. And keep doing the awesome stuff you do. Yay. And y'all, thanks for watching and listening today. And be sure to tune in next week to another episode of Business Unveiled. Bye. Y'all. That's it for this week's episode of Business Unveiled. Now that you have all the tools that you need to conquer the world and GSD, get shit done. Would you share this with your friends and fellow business leaders? One thing that would really, really help us and help new listeners is for you to rate the show and leave a comment in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you tune in and listen to Business Unveiled. 
You can check out the show notes at angelaprofit.com slash podcast and link up with us on social media so you can share your biggest insights. And I want to know your aha moments. Until next week, remember the profitable shifts and structures you're creating in your business help you be more present in your life. So get out there and GSD.